Hi, I'm David Hamburger, and welcome back to part two in my three-part series on how to get good at playing fingerstyle blues. If you missed the first lesson, you can find it here on the channel. I'll put a link down below. Basically, in the first lesson, we talked about how important it is to have a repertoire of tunes and how working with traditional tunes, those tunes are both uh, sturdy and flexible and how rather than worrying about playing some particular artist's version of that tune all the way through by getting familiar with the structure of the tune itself, learning the melody, learning the groove, learning the chord progression, you can use that as a basis for creating your own version of the tune by borrowing different pieces of what you like from other traditional versions of the tune but putting it together into something of your own. Now what happens when you do that is you wind up with an eight or a 12 bar arrangement of the tune where you can play the bass and you can put the melody over the bass. But that of course leaves you with the question, what next, right? Because you know what happens, you, you go to sit down and play or someone says, oh, you play guitar, why don't you play something? And there you are with this eight or 12 bar tune and nowhere to go with it. And so, you know, what's satisfying about playing is to be able to play something recognizable, to be able to play something that sounds interesting, to be able to play something that lasts for more than 15 seconds, and also to have something to be able to play that feels like it's your own. That when you're playing, you're doing something personal, you're doing something expressive, you're saying something you want to say with the instrument. So how do you turn those eight to 12 bars into a complete song? That's what we're gonna look at in this lesson. Now, this comes again, straight out of my own experience learning to play, because when I was a kid and I expressed interest in finger style music, my guitar teachers would give me something to work on and it would be this little exercise or this, you know, like how to play the actual melody to a tune. And I'd go home and I'd work on it and I'd come back and I'd go, this is great. I played it like 30 times in a row. Now what do I do? And they're like, well, that's kind of the thing. That's what it is. And I was like, God, there's got to be, there's got to be more, you know? And um, even when I was, uh, when I went on to write uh, lesson material for magazines like Acoustic Guitar and to make uh, all those lessons, video lessons for True Fire, um, again, the, the sort of the, the way that you can teach in those kinds of formats, like in a magazine article or in a concise video lesson, is to say, okay, we're gonna learn this technique, we're gonna learn this idea, uh, we're gonna do these exercises to get sort of fluent in whatever that particular thing is. We're playing in this key, or we're using these chords, or we're learning this scale. And then the culmination of that would be, and here's an exercise, and here's 12 bars, here's you know a blues that I wrote that incorporates that, but it's 12 bars long, and you can go and learn it, and it exemplifies how those ideas play out in the blues form. And that's cool, but I always wanted to know for myself and also to be able to show to other people, what does that turn into? Like, how do you take knowing that and turn that into sitting down and playing something that feels like a complete song? So that's what we're gonna look at in today's lesson. This is stuff that I worked out first for myself so that when I was sitting down to play, I had some place to go and something to do with the tunes that I like to play. And then it became the, really the basis for how I teach playing fingerstyle blues because I wanted two things. One is I wanted to be able to sit down and play something that was satisfying and complete, even if I wasn't singing. And I wanted to be able to do something interesting if I was singing, but I stopped to do you know a guitar break or a solo. And actually the, there's a third thing, which is clearly I wanted to be able to make it last and be interesting over the next couple of minutes, right? So it could actually feel like a complete song, whether it was being done instrumentally or not. So in this lesson, we're gonna look at how to take that, in this case, an eight bar tune, since we worked on You Got To Move in the last lesson, we'll continue developing that in this lesson. And we're gonna look at how to use a vamp and a shout chorus and a solo to develop that eight bar tune into a complete arrangement. Now, if you don't know what all those terms mean, don't worry, the first thing we're gonna do is talk about what those things are. What is a vamp? What is a shout chorus? What do I mean when I say solo? Is it improvised? Is it worked out? All of that. There's also 
uh, some tab for this lesson. I wrote out the things that I'm about to show you. And so you can go to the link below or the link on screen and download a PDF that's got uh, transcriptions of all the stuff I'm about to show you. So as you're going along, just kind of watch and listen and check it out and know that besides going back and looking at the video, you can also have this PDF and look at what, you know, what the notes are, look at how the bass and the fingers line up and all that kind of thing. So if you uh, want, go take a moment and download that PDF and we'll get into how to turn an eight bar blues into a complete song. All right, so let's start with the vamp. The vamp is usually either just rocking back and forth between two chords or a short four chord cycle. But the important thing about the vamp is that it exists outside the boundaries of the actual, in this case, eight bar tune. So it's basically something you're inventing or making up to use as an intro to lead into the tune as a way to sort of pause and catch your breath before starting the next thing after playing the melody a couple of times. Or it can be used as an outro, as a way to finish the tune after you've played the melody for the last time going out on the vamp. So for instance, two chords, you might just rock between the four chord and the one chord. So if we're in E, that's gonna be going from A to E. or maybe from the one chord to the five chord, from E to B. Or it could be more like a four chord cycle, like we could take those Rosetta Tharp chords, the one, six, two, five, going from E to C sharp to F sharp to B, so. But the point is, the vamp is, besides existing outside of the tune itself, and therefore being more flexible as far as what you can choose and what you can do with it, it's also, because it's short and it's cyclical, it can be expanded or collapsed however you need to expand or collapse it. So you could play through it just a couple of times, or you could play through it for a while, like on the way out of a tune. putting in some licks. You know, and so you can go as long as you've got ideas and different things to put in. So it can be a fixed thing or it can be yet another, like a kind of vehicle for improvising on a really small scale where you're just maybe playing this vamp and then there's this little space a couple of licks and it's one of those things that can be a nice bridge to improvisation because the pocket you need to improvise in is so small it's not like trying to create a whole solo more on that in the next lesson for now the important thing is the vamp is this flexible structure and so um, a specific example of how you could do that would be this first one that I played going from the four chord to the one chord so I'm playing a bar of E and a bar, a bar of A, followed by a bar of E. So one and two and three and four and one and two and three and four and. Now the thing is, the licks that I'm playing on top, if we isolate that, I'm playing one and two and three. So to sort of make it feel solid and have the thumb play four, uh, you know, well not four beats, two beats, one and two and on the fifth string, and then one and two, sorry, three and four and on the E string, you would, we're playing, you're anticipating the chord here, one and two and, going to the E chord on the and of two. So you can go to the E chord all the way across the fretboard, and the thumb can just play the fifth string on the and of two as well, but making sure you play a note that goes with the E chord. So one and two and, and then the 
bass comes over here. Three and four and one and two and three and four and. And that alone is enough of a structure. All I'm doing after that is I'm starting on the first fret of the second string, the flat third of the A chord, and sliding in on the first pinch with thumb, index, middle, and ring on the fifth, third, second, and first string. So like that. So one and two and, and probably hammering on on that and of two. So open third string and hammer on with the index finger. So. And after that, you can just put in a specific lick on the and four and. So one and two and three and four and. And it could be anything. I'm just picking a couple of basically simple blues licks. But the thing is that does that, if it sounds familiar to be saying and four and, that's because it's the same phrasing as the melody. And four and one, and four and one, right? So here, the vamp is invented, but it's not unrelated to the tune. It has the same groove, right? So that's the shuffle groove. <clears throat> We're playing from the four to the one, which are parts of the song. The song has a four chord and a one chord in it. And the licks we're playing uh, at the end of every other measure share the phrasing of the melody. They're just blues licks based on that phrasing. Now, as far as what to do with this, <clears throat> even if you just knew a basic version of the melody and this vamp, you could now take that eight bar melody that was just sitting there by itself, taking up maybe 10 seconds of your life, and you could create this structure where you play the vamp and then you play the melody, then you play the vamp, the melody, and the vamp. And the secret to doing that is to take the, uh, the turnaround, bar seven and eight, And swap that out and start the vamp in bar seven. So you get this. You'd start with the vamp, maybe play it four times. Then play the tune. Right, so we're on our way to having this more complete structure that expresses the tune, but also has a little bit of other stuff around it in the form of this vamp and those really small, simple licks at the tail end of each, you know, every other bar of the vamp. So that's how the vamp can help us start building things out. Now the shout chorus is a whole other thing. And the term shout chorus comes from 30s and 40s jazz. And it's about that moment in a big band arrangement like the Count Basie band or someone like that, where they would get to uh, a part in the tune where they would want to sort of build a big climax to the tune. And so all of the horn players would play on a similar 
chord based riff based kind of thing and so if you've got like you know 12 or 13 horn players all playing at once i guess the idea is it sounds like a bunch of people shouting probably where the term came from so the shout chorus is meant to be this sort of climactic moment and in the context of an eight bar tune like this it's something you would do on the first four bars of the tune and then you might play uh, some single note ideas or some licks to finish out the tune but here's the thing it's unlike the vamp which you can kind of invent out of whole cloth the shout chorus uh, is built within the form of the tune so you play chords and rhythms that work over the actual form of the tune the chord progression and the groove of the original tune so for instance you might have say these chords up the neck like take an e7 chord up here with the flat seven and the root and the fifth and then when you get to the a chord take this a chord and keep this note on top so it's an a add nine and that gives the the riff or the rhythmic idea a certain kind of continuity you have the chord shifting underneath but the same common tone on top and so maybe you play uh, like a triplet rhythm so and then the A chord and maybe even the A minor chord and then you're you're done with those first four bars now you could also break it up a little more you could play chords on bars one and three and then answer with some blues licks so So taking this chord and playing triplets for four beats, one and a, one and a, two and a, three and a, four and a, and then this blues lick, so I'm playing the fourth, the flat five, the fourth, the flat third, the root, and then sliding up to play the root on both the second and the first string. And then repeating that, that pickup note, and again, and four and, Right? There's that rhythm again that comes right out of the melody. And then up to the A chord. And then same blues lick, but make it a double stop so you can get the flat third of the A minor chord in there. So now we've got... got bars five and six to mess with because by bar seven we want to get into the turnaround or maybe the vamp but bar seven so just like the tail end of the vamp gives us just that one little pocket where we can do a single note lick the shout chorus gives us just these two bars in bars five and six where we can do a little bit of a solo before getting into the turnaround so again a great place to start learning to play licks or to improvise because it's such a small area to fill up. You're not trying to play a whole chorus. So in the tab, I just wrote out a couple of specific licks. I'm trying to remember exactly what I played, but the idea is something simple. Oh, that's right. So something, and we'll talk about this more in the next lesson, which is more about coming up with licks and maybe improvising some of them. But here, just the idea that again, and four and one and. So I'm coming into bar five. So I've done this. Everything's built out of that same sort of primal rhythm that the tune is based around. And so you don't have to necessarily go too far to find ideas because if you've internalized that phrasing from the melody, it will start to 
crop up or occur to you as you try to come up with single note ideas. So shout chorus can be a fixed thing, even those licks. You don't have to improvise them to begin with. You can just use those specific ones that I've just played as, as placeholders and as practice for, oh, that's where the licks go, right? So the whole shout chorus. So at this point, now we've got a vamp, we have a fundamental version of the tune, maybe we have an embellished version of the tune, and we have this shout chorus, which is worth playing a couple of times in a row. So that really gives us the tools to create something very complete and satisfying with a real kind of arc to it. So we could start with the vamp, play the fundamental, play the embellished, drop back into the vamp in bar seven, and placing the turnaround the second time through the melody. Play on the vamp a few times, and then go into the shout chorus, two times through the shout chorus, come back to the melody, either fundamental or embellished, and then vamp out. So that could sound like this. So that's how you can take just the basic eight or 12 bar version of the tune and begin to expand it into something that feels like a complete song, like a complete arrangement. Now in this lesson, we've just talked about two of the three elements I mentioned at the beginning, the, the vamp and the shout chorus. In the next lesson, I'll talk about how to start creating solos whether that's improvised or working out your own ideas ahead of time that you can put into the arrangement and play through somewhere between the fundamental and embellished version and getting to the shout chorus. But in the meantime, if you don't have the tab yet, you can go to the link below or the link on screen and you can download the PDF with all of the examples from the first lesson and this lesson. So 
if you're struggling to find a way to play things that sound familiar or interesting, um, you know, if nothing that you play really lasts for more than 10 or 15 seconds, uh, and if you don't feel like what you're playing feels expressive or sounds like you, working through these ideas can give you a way to start developing all of those things so that you end up with a repertoire of tunes that you've worked out that are rooted in traditional blues, but feel like they are part of what you want to play and that come from the best of what it is you enjoy listening to and want to incorporate into your own songs and your own arrangements. So go check out the tab. Join me for the next lesson about how to start creating licks and solos to put into your arrangements. And if you've got a question about today's lesson, you can scroll down and leave me a comment below and I'll see you at the next one. Thanks for watching. Thank you.